Okay. That seems to work. So, on Monday, we have Magnesium 5. It includes electron configuration, which is 6.4, all of Chapter 7. So, if you own the textbook and you're like, wow, we only talked about like half of it, I don't want to say obviously, but that is what the exam, mini exam will cover, is the stuff that we've covered in class. The other portions you can read if you'd like. And whatever part of chapter 8 we cover today, we should get through bond polarity in that case, which is where I think we'll get, but we will adjust that accordingly based on how the day goes. Any questions about any of this and or any other information relating to this course? or other, I don't want to say choices, but anything else? What, for those of you who completed the end of chapter questions, what is the answer to this one? We got Yeah, 2.81. Any questions? The answer is 2.81. So it's half of each of those bonds. Which of these elements has the largest I2? Carbon, is that? Argon. Mm. It's actually going to be sodium. It is sodium because I2 is the removal of the second cation. It's the creation of the dication. But argon would have had the greatest falling if it was I1. Excellent. Which element of the following has the strongest electron affinity? So we have an argon, which got krypton, okay. So uh, noble gases have positive electron affinity, which means they do not want it at all. So which one has, is the most likely? Um, chlorine. chlorine. So krypton, argon, neon, all of the noble gases have a positive electron affinity, which is code for they will refuse to take it. Excellent. Questions about either of these trends? Out of the following elements, neon, sodium, magnesium, or aluminum, oops, and silicon, which of these corresponds to the following ionization series? Why? Yeah, that is correct. So this series corresponds to magnesium. If we look at, let me get out my laser pointer. If you look at the I1 to I2 spacing, it's about 700 kilojoules. I2 to I3 is about 6.5, well, we'll say 6,500. 3,000 and 3,000. So this large separation means that the I2, or the two positive, has the noble gas configuration. After today, we will call that the, well, it has octet, but we are going to learn that in like 10 minutes. So questions about this question. You should expect to justify something. Justifications are not because. It doesn't have to be a full sentence. It needs to be a statement that says why you believe it is that one. Justification in this case would include, we see the large gap between I2 and I3, etc. So for my justification, I wrote down why it couldn't be any of the other ones. Would that also be satisfactory? Yes, I think so. Okay. 
It should be provided that your other rationales are on par with what it what it corresponds to. Other questions? The fourth ionization of lead is the formation of the four plus species. So we have PB three plus goes to PB four plus plus one E minus in order for the fourth ionization of lead. Questions about, yeah. Yes. Sometimes I use the one, sometimes I don't. I don't particularly care, but I, I don't know why today it's here. It just is. Good question, though. Other questions? What about the electron affinity of carbon? So the third electron affinity is the addition of the third electron. So we have C2 minus plus E minus goes to C3 minus. And you may have the one coefficient or no one coefficient. Either is acceptable. Questions about periodic trends? We're all prepared for mini exam five that will contain some number of points similar to this. I appreciate the thumbs up in the back. Any, any follow up questions about periodic trends? So we will make it through, I'm thinking about halfway through bond polarity today. So let's talk about chapter eight. So in this chapter, in chapter eight, we are building the foundation. So if you remember back to chapter six, you know, the light, electrons, all that. We spent a lot of time building foundations so that we could think about electron configuration. Chapter eight is gonna be about how to think about structures of molecules in two dimensions. Mastery of this will make chapter nine where we take our 2D structures and make it into a 3D structure better, not better. So it'll be easier because you'll have a really good foundation of how do I make a Lewis dot structure? And so what we're gonna think about today is how do we create these structures in terms of what a Lewis dot structure is, what is a bond, because we're gonna draw molecules, molecules have bonds, what do they look like? So the Lewis symbols and octet. So Lewis dot symbols. So chemical bonding, where we can say bonds are created, are formed using Valence electrons, which I tend to abbreviate VE because it takes a long time to write valence electrons, and I will write it 500 times today. And so the valence electrons, which are our out exterior electrons, valence electrons are typically the S and P electrons. And as we move forward, we can see that two valence electrons form a bond. So today, if you go in the lab and you create a new structure, you make a new molecule. If you could make a crystal, kind of like a salt crystal or anything else that crystallizes, you can take it to certain places, shoot it with, I don't want to say lasers, because that sounds way fun. You can shoot it with x-rays or different types of lasers and figure out exactly what it looks like in 3D space. In the past, that wasn't really a choice or it wasn't really the same as it is today. So one of the things that G.N. Lewis did is he decided to develop a model by which we can structurally think about atoms in two-dimensional space. So G.N. Lewis, developed a method by which we can draw 
the valence electrons of any, well, of many elements. And he was very instrumental in the development of the rule of octet. So he focuses on the rule of octet. And so octet means eight. So we know that an octagon has eight sides. So octet means a group of eight. And so his idea is that every element wants to achieve this octet. Octet being that it has a surrounding of eight electrons. So one of the things we're going to think about is how do different elements organize their valence electrons? So if each element contains is surrounded by an eight-sided or an eight-person table where two electrons can sit on each side, as we fill these, they fill across from one another. We'll make that four, and then I wrote it third, to where all electrons want to be as far apart as humanly possible. Electrons are both negative. Two electrons do not want to occupy the same space, if at all humanly possible. In this way, what we're going to do is they want to be as far apart as possible. It can seat up to eight people. So the organization of the other four seats follows the same pattern. To where, if you have single electrons, they are as far apart as humanly possible. So let's look at sulfur. That is a spelling of sulfur. You may think about it in a different way. It's just one. So the electron configuration of sulfur is neon 3s2, 3p4. So it turns out that neon is the core. And these are the valence. And there are six valence electrons. So to draw the Lewis dot structure of sulfur, we're going to put our S in the middle. And then we have six electrons that need to go somewhere around. You have a couple of choices. You can either, one, memorize the rules. Always use the rules. Two, it turns out that there are only eight different options of valence electrons. So you can memorize the eight options and just be like, oh, six, it always looks like this. Both will get you to the same place. You will do both in the grand scheme of things. So we have six electrons that we need to put around. We're going to put one on either side, then one on the top and one on the bottom. Now we have two other electrons that need to get added. They will follow the same rules, one on either side. You can rotate this to where your two dots are on the on the middle or on the top. Here are some wrong options. And I will put a box around this in case you look up and you're like, which of those is correct? These are wrong. They do not follow the Lewis dot structure rules. So if you look at the top rung structure, there are six valence electrons. They are all in pairs. So you have a side that is empty. For the one at the bottom, the Lewis dot structures are not following the, the single electrons want to be as far apart as humanly possible. So when we think about this, what we are drawing is what do they look like? So the reason we really think about octet has to do with the fact that atoms tend to, if you have the slides, this is the stuff that you, I would write on the next slide. So we can say atoms gain or lose electrons to achieve octet. What we mean by that is if we think about sulfur. I told you, that feels very aggressive, back in chapter two when we were learning the expected charge on sulfur, 
we said, hey, everything in this column is a minus two. So it turns out that that minus two is related to the Lewis Dobbs structure and related to the rule of octet. For sulfur, we have neon, 3s2, 3p4. Oops. So we have this. When we think about S2 minus, we have neon, 3s2, 3p6. This valence shell is, whoops, is full. So it has octet. And we can see that there are eight electrons here. So they gain or lose electrons in either the P or the S in order to achieve octet. And so as we think about octet, we can have both versions of this. So you can draw a Lewis dot structure of S2 minus, which I will do over here. It also has all of the dots. And then you put it in brackets and say that it has a two minus charge. And I'm gonna erase part of the sulfur, make it a little shorter, that doesn't work at all. If you wanted to draw the Lewis dot structure of an ion, it would look like this. What questions do we have about Lewis dot structures thus far? Uh, no. Okay, the magnetic spin, like M sub F, or the magnetic spin. Or, plus or minus one. No. I was just asking because, you know, the arrow is saying I wanted to make sure I wasn't placing them incorrectly. No, so in this case, this is just an orientation mode, like how they you orient them, as long as you end up with this structure. And these are considered a lone pair. And these are just single electrons. Single electrons overwhelmingly are bad. We don't want to have those. Uh, yeah? So a lone pair is going to be that they're not as much to, that they're not connected to. Mm -hmm. In a second, we'll start thinking about bonds. Hang out on that. Okay, what did you say the single one was? Well, I said he was lonely, but. He doesn't really have a name, it's just an electron. Typically, we find them in pairs. When we find them alone, they're either going to get with another electron. Oh, that sounds very weird. They interact with another electron to form a bond, or in probably next Wednesday, we'll talk about situations where you have odd numbers of electrons, and that you can have one lonely electron left over. But that is a rare, I don't want to call it spontaneous, but a rare case. So let's look at some examples. So we have phosphorus, chlorine, boron, and magnesium. The valence electrons are relatively simple. I don't want to say they're simple. They are deceptively simple to figure out. If you look at your periodic table, everything in the first column has one valence electron. Everything in the second has two. Transition metals do not apply. We do not think about their valence electrons. They just don't exist to us. Over here, boron has three, carbon has four, dot, 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 all the way until you get to the noble gases, which have eight, with the exception of helium, which only has two. So, because helium only has two electrons, that is a full we're going to call it octet, even though it only is two, because no one says it has a duo. Maybe we should, maybe we should go for that, right? No? Okay, come on. I think I'm hilarious. Phosphorus has five valence electrons. I would recommend that you always follow the rules. One, two, three, four, five. Now, your lone pair where the side with the two can be on the left, on the right, on the top, or the bottom. You may put it 
wherever makes you happy. You just can only have one lone pair, right? You're like, great. Right. We all are mostly on board with that. Question? Chlorine, seven valence electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Same thing here. Your single electron can be on any of the four sides, as long as you only have one single electron. What questions do we have about Lewis dot structures of elements? So the rules also give you this. This. Hold on. I gotta draw like a lot of dots. All of these three structures, basically the single electron has almost like rotated around. So I almost always start on the left. You uh, that, That's what I recommend. But you could start on the top or the bottom. And so sometimes what you'll notice is I move where the single electron is, I won't say based on how I'm feeling, but kind of, based on what I want it to do next. So all of these are valid and equivalent structures. They just, you can only have one electron and it could be at either of those four sides. It's a good question. Other questions? There are, in fact, only eight Lewis dot structures, right? You can have one through eight valence electrons. They all look the same. A couple of things. On our mini exam on Monday, you may notice that even those of you in the back can see, well, hopefully, you can see my dots. Please make the dots legible. And what I mean by that is if you write this, I don't know what's a dot and what is just like you drop your pen. Make, they don't have to be like a colossal mountain, just like something where I know what it is. Um, you may be asked to draw the Lewis dot structure of ions. They go in brackets with the charge on the outside. If I am concerned that the negative charge will be lost, it may say like sulfur with two negative charges or something else so that you know that it's clearly a charge, not just the printer being bad at its job. Excellent. I have a question. Yeah. So for positive, it's the same thing. You just write the positive on the outside bracket instead of the negative. Yeah, but you would have lost the electron. Typically, the downside with a positive, so sodium plus, is just in a in a bracket with a plus around it, because we don't think of the next shell as being the valence electron. Which is why there are some issues with the noble gas configuration in electron configuration. Other. Oh, it would be, it would say something like, if it was S2 minus, sometimes I think the negative signs get real small in my font. So it might say like S2 minus, open parentheses, sulfur, negative two charge. Or alternatively, if you're like, is this a accident? You could just raise your hand and ask. I'm happy to answer that. Or if you're like, what is this? Not what is this element, but is this element? So chlorine and carbon iodide look the same, unfortunately. So if you're ever like, I don't know what this is, you should just ask. As opposed to writing some struggle bus all the way to the end. I mean, like, I didn't know. Raise your hand and I'll say that is a this element. So next, we want to take our lonely atoms, and we want to start thinking about bonds. A bond, as it said somewhere, is composed of two elements, two electrons. A bond is how elements stick together. So it turns out that electrons between elements can be shared in a covalent bond or unshared in what we're going to talk about first, which is called an ionic bond. 
So an ionic bond is found in ionic compounds. which are metal plus non-metal. And so ionic compounds are always non-metal and metal. And what we're going to learn is that they do not share electrons. No sharing. So we know that sodium chloride exists. We know that because hopefully you have it at your house or your table. So sodium chloride interacts together where we have sodium and chlorine bound together. So if we think about this as a Lewis dot structure, where we have sodium with a single electron and chlorine with a single electron, two single electrons, and what we're going to see when we talk about covalent bonds, is that those two look like they should form a bond. However, when we think about the ionization energy of sodium, which is really low, sodium basically gives away its electron as soon as humanly possible. We know that chlorine has a very high electron affinity. So instead of creating a bond, what we actually see is that sodium donates its electron to chlorine to where we have Na plus and chlorine with a full octet chlorine minus. So sodium also has octet. We do not typically draw the octet atoms or something a, a cation because that would indicate that the valence electrons are full when in fact sodium has no valence electrons in this case. So here we have sodium plus and chlorine minus stuck together. So the formation of this interaction is highly exothermic. When you make ionic compounds, they tend to give off a lot of energy. So typically exothermic doesn't really always lead to super stable interactions. And so we know that this exists, and we know that ionic solids are a thing. And we know that because when you go to Publix or Winn-Dixie or Walmart or wherever you buy groceries, you can buy sodium chloride that is a solid. If you get fancy, you could buy potassium chloride if you need to be on a low sodium diet. So in this case, we know this exists. We also know that there are no bonds in this interaction. Usually bonds increase stability. So it turns out that sodium chloride is composed, if this is an ionic solid, where it is created, or you could say stabilized, by the interactions Of the ions. And so in this case, all of these ions interact with one another. And what we see oh. I can't draw this in 3D. Like I'm real good, but not. What we see is an ionic solid where every negative charge is surrounded on 360 degrees. So you can imagine this basically comes out in this direction and goes back into the board. So where this positive charge has a negative charge on all of these interactions, as well as above and below. So that interaction creates a latticework of positive and negative charges. So this lattice of positive slash negative charges stabilizes 
the sun. So basically, these elements fit together in such a way that this is super stable in the absence of a bond. And so we can think about that stability as being related to the lattice energy. So lattice energy, or the magnitude of this, depends on the charges and the distance between. So it could be related to the electrostatic potential, which is Boltzmann's constant, Q1, Q2, over the distance. So we can think about the lattice energy and how that might change. So if you look at the graphic on the slide, we can see that lithium fluoride of the one-to-one -one charges, so it's basically broken up in plus one, minus one on the left. On the right, we have plus two, minus ones, minus two, plus two, and a minus three, plus three. We can see variation in the lattice energy for things where this constant, always the same. Q1 and Q2 are always the same, right? If it's a plus one, minus one. So the biggest distance here, difference is the distance. And that's based on the atomic size. So when two tiny elements get together, their electrostatic energy is quite large, whereas cesium iodide has a much lower lattice energy. So you could predict the stability or the interaction of things based on their lattice energy. Questions? So we have thought about the ionization state of elements all semester long, right? We just said things like, you know, aluminum is plus three. We made it a fact. I'm sure some of you either had the question, but why? And some of you may have asked, and I said, we'll talk about it later. Well, this is later, so that's good. But the reason why we think about some of these, so if we look at sodium, we have 1s2, 2s2, and 2p6, 3s1. So when you create sodium plus, you get 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. So it has a fully filled core electron shell. Conversely, if you wanted to get crazy and make sodium minus, we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. So the negative electron here is quite destabilized based on the effective and other properties. So the reason we don't see this is because adding the electrons doesn't increase the stability, where the removal of this single s electron makes it quite stable ion. So all of the plus or minus charges that we've talked about all semester, oxygen, chlorine, all of these is due to these interactions. So if we look at oxygen, 1s2, 2s2, 2p4, if we think about O2 minus, it's 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. And it is more stable because it has achieved octet. So the ionic configuration of the elements is a combination of the ionization energy, the electron affinity, based on the electron configuration, all of these things together. So we can now look at our periodic table and maybe have a little greater understanding as to why the first column prefers to be plus one. Questions? Hmm? So, does that relate back to that? So, uh, the sodium would make you the positive and negative. Does that relate back to the lattice? Like, is it basically kind of just like demonstrating the lattice? So, this, the lattice occurs for ionic solids, right? This is true for any given element. But when we see these in the Lattice energy, 
the reason you have an O2 minus, so like magnesium oxide, is magnesium 2 plus, because it releases, release, gives up two electrons, in that case, to the oxygen, to be at a, at the neon core. So it loses its two valence electrons, where oxygen gains two more to make it have octet. That's, that's where we're going with that statement. Transistor metals do not really have valence electrons. The S electrons can be, and sometimes the DR. We're not going to calculate the valence electrons of those. We're not going to really draw them in structures. Because in a usual twist, they don't follow any rules, so it makes it really impossible for you guys to think about what it is they do. So really, I don't want to say stuff. For the remainder of this semester, until we get to chapter 10, we are going to start thinking about covalent bonds. So we just talked about ionic bonds. They do not share electrons. They, you either have them or you don't, and you both have octets. So covalent bonds... So covalent bonds, these are, these bonds are found in molecular compounds. For example, these tend to be nonmetal. Non-metal. So in the past, we've talked about ionic compounds and then everything else. So that everything else is called a molecular compound, and molecular compounds are composed of covalent bonds. And covalent bonds share electrons. And a bond is composed of two electrons. And so we can think about these covalent bonds. We're going to talk about covalent bonds. And in a minute, we're going to talk about when covalent bonds have issues with sharing. Sharing implies that if the cookie breaks in half, you both get half. We're going to talk about when one element gets more of the electron density than the other. But for now, for like the next 10 minutes, we are going to pretend that everyone shares beautifully. So a covalent bond is composed of two electrons. And these electrons are shared between the nuclei. So it's really important to think about we have two nuclei and we have electrons between them in a covalent bond. In an ionic bond, you have two nuclei and no sharing is happening. So if we think about hydrogen gas, which we know is a diatomic, now we want to take our molecular formulas and we're going to build up to drawing it both in two-dimensional and in three-dimensional. So if we want to think about this, we have two hydrogens. We know that hydrogen has a, like one, valence electron. So we can draw that as H dot, and this guy also has a dot. Where two electrons combine, we can create a bond. So we can see that both of these have one. Sometimes I like to draw mine on the other side because it makes it look like the two Legos fit together. Anywhere is fine. But these two single bonds are going to interact together. So where we have hydrogen and hydrogen, where they interact. So we want to ask, did you achieve octet? Here, no one has octet. 
I'd like to remind you that hydrogen's octet is actually just like a duet. It only needs two electrons. All the rest of them need more. So if we look at hydrogen on the left, he, they, can lay claim to two electrons. Hydrogen on the right may also lay claim to two electrons. So this creates a bond. And so this element, you could draw this alternatively as this, where this line is a two electron bond. And we typically call those a single bond. And so each of these elements contain two electrons. Question about H2. So let's look at something who actually has octet. Because hydrogen doesn't, doesn't always work. So let's look at Cl2. We know this exists as a diatomic. In this case, we have two chlorines that both have seven valence electrons. And we need them to make octet. Now, we know that chlorine has a really high electron affinity. So hypothetically, it could take this electron, and now this one would have octet, but the other would not. That doesn't feel very kind. Feel is a relative word here. So the idea here is we're talking about covalent bonds so we can share. So these two electrons are going to form a bond. If they share them, they both have octet. So we're going to take our chlorine chlorine, and you're going to bring with it all of your valence electrons, or your electrons in totality. So now, we can see this has eight electrons, and this also has eight electrons. So we made a single bond, or a covalent bond, between these. These here, oops, let's put that back together. These are bonding electrons. These over here are lone pairs. So each chlorine has a set of bonding electrons, so two bonding electrons, and six lone pair electrons, or three lone pairs surrounding it. What questions do we have about? Basic simple Lewis dot structures. So let's look at some that are perhaps not just the same element stuck together. So on Monday, I think, we are going to look at a different set of rules. This works really well for what I like to call Lego reactions. Legos, you can basically poke them together. In this case, if we think about HF, we know that HF is composed of hydrogen and fluorine. So it makes it really easy for us to imagine something that looks like this. For a structure. Today, when we think about basic structures, these all fit together rather easily. We're going to move to much, much, much more complicated structures next week using the guidelines. For today, we can kind of look at these and say, I can see how those fit together. I do want to address something that many of you might be like, oh, I can save so much time. If I just wrote this, and you made your lone pairs into lines. If you've never seen this before, great. I absolutely hate this. There is a logical explanation for why people use it. If a, if this is a set of lone pairs, why it's two electrons, why doesn't this work? The problem is if you start using those on larger molecules where we have multiple bonds, when we draw them in 3D space, it turns into just a mess. Your lone pairs must be dots. You should have two dots. 
Any questions? Feel free to share that with your friends who are not here today. Usually people who come to class know what it is that I'm looking for. So absolutely none of that. So if we look at water, which is H2O, we have two hydrogens, we have oxygen that looks like this. So we can imagine that they all fit together with H, O, H, and two lone pairs. Questions about any of these? Hmm? So when you add the bond pair, basically one electron is like taken away. It's like how you did like hydrogen and fluorine, how it was, it's like actually seven or one. Eight electrons, and then once you add like the pair, the hydrogen electron goes away, so then you just left with the six. Well, so the hydrogen and the fluorine both donate one electron to make a bond. This bond is composed of two electrons. So there's two N here, so if you look for octet, hydrogen has two, and fluorine also has eight. It's a good question. We are going to draw so many of these over the next like three weeks. You should attempt both ammonia and methane in the like three minutes it will take you later. If you have questions about it, I'm happy to look at it. But let's think about what happens if you don't make a single bond. So a single bond is where you have two electrons. All bonds are composed of two electrons. But it turns out that there are some elements where they don't tend to make only one bond. Or they don't yet have octet. So let's think about oxygen. O2. We have oxygen. It has our six valence electrons. We got two of them. So we can put those together. So neither of these oxygens have octet. No matter how you slice this, they only have seven electrons. So oxygen has six valence electrons. We need to get them to octet. It turns out that when you have these two lone electrons, they can both be utilized to make something called a double bond. which is basically four electrons where you have two bonds. So this bond is different both chemically and physically than a oxygen if you had a single bond between two oxygens. So in this case, we have what's called a double bond. Questions about a double bond? So when you go from here, are you thinking that we should have this? Yeah, is that, is that more correct or is that or is it really just kind of the same thing? It turns out that electrons want to be in pairs. So once you put them into a molecule, if they came from a lone pair, they should stay as a lone pair. When we look at the larger molecule guidelines, that will actually substantially, you'll never have lone electrons again. It, we only really think about that with this like Lego click together method that helps set up how the rest of it works. Otherwise, you will always set them up as they come as pairs. So the lone pair thing, would it be for the ones that are not like the odd ones? So, there are some compounds that only have an odd number of electrons. We haven't 
We've only made tiny compounds, so let's hold those for next Wednesday when we meet them. Because those, like many other things, are things that are going to violate all the rules. So let's leave them with sliding the rules and then figure out why some people just can't with the rules. Some come out. Good question. Other question. Yeah. Is it a trend for elements of six valence bonds to have the most um, stable structure as a double bond? Or is that just oxygen? Uh, oxygen is the only one in that column that makes this compound. Okay. Because sulfur does not make S2. It makes S8, which clearly tells you that something is very different in that structure. So if we look at nitrogen gas, we have our single structure that looks like this. So we have a single lone pair and three lone electrons, which tells us that we have a total of 10 valence electrons. 10 makes it really hard for one element to have eight alone because obviously the other one will have not eight. So it turns out that nitrogen has these three lone electrons. So here we have two, four, six valence electrons around each one, but we can take these two lone electrons and make a bond, and these two and make a bond. So now we have what's called a triple bond. And this is six electrons between two atoms. There are, in fact, three types of bonds. Single bond, double bond, and triple bond. There's no quadruple bonds. There's no anything after that. It's one, two, or three. That's it. We will talk about when you know to use them. Today we're just talking about that they exist. There are rules as to when we use them and rules as to when we don't, but we will get there. So what questions do you have percolating around in your brain about bonding, creating basic Lewis dot structures? So let's talk about polarity. So in most of these structures, I said, you know, these electrons are shared. It turns out, like most things, more often than not, sharing is not equal. Somebody gets a little bit more slice of cake, someone eats more of the french fries than the other person, whatever. However you encounter sharing in your I don't want to say adult life, but we all know that sharing equally is really difficult. So it turns out that overwhelmingly, elements don't necessarily share their electrons as well as we feel like they should. So the first thing we can think about is bond types. So when two electrons share, no, when two elements share electrons, they have a, the ability to share or steal. But like most things, there's a large space between sharing equally and one person has the electrons and the other doesn't. And so we're going to talk about that place in between. So bond polarity this is a measure. of how well the electrons are shared between two elements. So bond polarity, so you can have something called a polar bond, but a nonpolar covalent Basically, a nonpolar bond is a bond where electrons are equally shared in a molecule. So a polar bond 
one where electrons are unequally shared in the bottom. And so in this case, what we're going to start to think about is, well, how do we know? Just because, like, hey, some share and some don't, we want the ability to say, I know that that bond is going to be unequal. We are going to reach a point where we can say how unequal it is. Not today, but on Monday. So how do we know how well they share? So we can use the last of the periodic trends. So this is the last one. And this one is called electronegativity. I often abbreviate it using the symbol chi to where we give a value. It is the chi value for one of these. Electronegativity is the ability of an atom there we go, in a molecule to attract electrons to itself. So electronegativity is the ability of any element to essentially say, I'm going to start just bringing those electrons in. And so elements with a negative electron affinity and a high ionization energy <coughs> attract electrons. So the modern electronegativity scale combines electron affinity, ionization energy, and other atomic properties to determine time. This was developed by Linus Pauling. So it's about 80 years old. And so there are different electronegativity scales. It turns out that if we think about those, we can't, there is a scale. This is the scale for the electronegativity for the elements in the periodic table. So, but the trend or the value is important when we think about a molecule and a bond. So the absolute value of any of these is super important, but may or may not be relevant. So in this case, the, the difference between two elements tells you about the bond. You can guess using the periodic trend where it increases as you go across and decreases as you go down. So the highest elements are fluorine in the top right with 4.0. And so the noble gases do not have electronegativity. You will notice that they are not present on this graphic because they frankly don't follow the rules as to whether or not they will accept or donate electrons. They are mostly inert. And so when we think about this, we can think about the difference between different elements. We know that fluorine is the most electronegative atom. So we expect it to always be in a polar bond. Maybe we don't yet. But we can think about whether or not fluorine is going to share or share not. Not at all. So if we have the fluorine-fluorine bond, 4.0 minus 4.0 is zero. This is a nonpolar bond. 
if we think about HF, we have 4.0 minus 2.1, which is 1.9. This is a polar bond. We can also look at lithium chloride, and I'm on the space right there, LIF, and in this case, we have 4.0 minus 1.0, and that gives you 3.0. We know that lithium chloride is ionic. And we know that because it is composed of a metal and a non-metal. So we can use the difference in electronegativity in order to determine whether or not a bond is polar or nonpolar. So in general, nonpolar bonds are zero-ish. I know ish is super scientific. A polar bond is 0.5-ish to 1.9. We don't really see two, the value of two. An ionic bond is this should go to 2.9. This is above three. The larger the difference, the stronger the polarity. So if you have a 2.5, it's a quite polar bond. It's a good question. It doesn't actually matter whether it's 1, one minus 4 or 4 minus 1. It's technically the absolute value. But I always just think like big minus small. Or you can take the absolute value. Either of those will get you to the right answer. I prefer the more scientific method of large minus small. Good question. Other questions about electronegativity? So these bonds, we have sharing. This, you can think of unequal sharing. There is no sharing for an ionic bond. So the question becomes, what does that look like? So in these graphics on the bottom are the electron density maps. So if you look at F2, it's green, which means neither of these elements is more negative or positive than the others. But one of the things you can see the difference between HF and LIF is that it becomes more oblong, right? Where it looks more and more negative on the fluorine side. So that is the polar and ionic bonds, or when we start to see this charge-charge separation. So this, we, what, well, first, what questions do we have about electronegativity? So how can you expect to use this information on the mini exam? Because I feel like that's a pretty, like I feel like I told you thing. So one, you could use this trend the same way you did any of the other trends. Which of these is the most electronegative atom? Which of these is the least? You could rank those. You could also, if you were provided a table of the electronegativity values, such as the fluorine is zero, hydrogen is 2.1, lithium is one. You can subtract them and determine which bond is the most polar. You could also use the trend to analyze lots of stuff. You can use the trend to determine which of these bonds would be polar. Because the proximity of elements in the periodic table tells you about polarity. When they are very close together, it's more likely to be a polar bond. Because if you look at this graphic, the carbon iodine bond is nonpolar, even though it's a halogen, and we typically think of it as being quite polar. 
That was a exam. Do we have to memorize those values, or are those things like given to us like for a question? Do you have to like calculate? If you have to calculate it, I'll give it to you. If I gave you something like this, you can use the trends as long as it is a static distance. Me, what I mean by that is, I can't give you carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and something else. That like then you would need to know what the electronegativity values are. But as long as the cation stays the same, you should be able to determine the dip, which ones are polar based on their proximity. There are way more things, and we will continue our discussion of polarity on Monday when we think about how do we know which direction the electrons go and how do we calculate that, all those kind of things. But this is going to be where mini exam five stops. Questions? So the interesting about the And the carbon hydrogen. So this is the only nonpolar bond. Mm, carbon hydrogen would also be nonpolar. I'd like to recheck. Non this is the only polar bond. Sorry. Carbon oxygen is polar, and I got those confused in my brain. Other questions? Ionic is non-sharing. So we have non-polar, which is at zero, so they're the same. But ionic bonds tend to have, when they're a non-metal metal, they should always be at or above three. Okay, so if you were to ask them a question, and so which one is, for example, which one is polar and ionic is in it? That is correct. That is, I like to think about it like sharing a blanket with two humans. You can share, one person can hoard it, or alternatively, you can steal the whole blanket. And so there's no sharing going on in this case because one element has taken all of the electrons. It's a good question. Any other questions? Fantastic, y'all have a fantastic weekend, and I will see you all on Monday.